As I say, 16 through 20 is really Luke's basic description of Paul's mission. Supposing for a moment, as I think may be the case, that one of the reasons Luke is writing Acts is in order to explain to somebody, some Roman official, some court, um, who Paul is and what he's up to, this is the heart which tells you this is the stuff that Paul did. And the key things are the confrontation with pagan religion, the confrontation with pagan authority, the confrontation then by reflex with Jewish people around in the pagan world, and then again and again and again, Paul announcing Jesus, Paul explaining who Jesus is, Paul suffering for Jesus, Paul relying on the guidance of Jesus. You can see, can't you, how from this account, so much of Paul's letter, uh, letter corpus just falls into place. Him we proclaim, warning every man and teaching everyone in all wisdom to pre present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, striving with all the energy which he mightily inspires within me. It's the end of Colossians 1. You can see him doing it. Note in particular throughout this passage the crescendo of encounters with Roman political authority. Chapter 16, verse 20 following, they are brought before the magistrates in Philippi. These men are disturbing our city. Notice what the charge is. They are Jews and are advocating customs which are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. A convenient charge. We'll see why they brought that in a minute. Then chapter 17, verse 6 and following, some people have said, after all, that, that Luke was politically quiescent and that the early church in Luke's presentation had no main conflict, no actual conflict with the powers that be. And here we've got, they are all acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying there is another king, namely Jesus. How in your face can you get? Jesus is Lord, Caesar isn't. And that's picked up in this passage. And then chapter 17, verses 18 and following, the Epicureans and Stoics in Athens, what does this babbler want to say? Ah, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. Well, that's not, not just a matter of idle philosophical curiosity. Have you got some more gods up your sleeve? We'd like to know about them. Who was the most famous person put on trial in Athens in the ancient world? What were the two charges against Socrates? Corrupting the youth and preaching foreign divinities. This is a dangerous charge Paul is on here. And then chapter 18, verse 13. Interestingly, when Paul is in Corinth, he's been accused of being a Jew teaching anti-Roman customs, and now he's being accused of teaching anti-Jewish customs. Verse 13, this man is persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. And then the riot in Ephesus, we'll come back to that in, in a minute, where they get together, where the whole thing rushes together. But it's very interesting, isn't it, that in Philippi, the riot begins with a problem about business. Paul exorcises the slave girl. And uh, verses 18 and 19... And when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they dragged Paul and Silas into the marketplace, brought them to the magistrates. The, the threat to business presented then an excuse for a threat about them being basically anti-Roman. And then we get the wonderful scene with the jail and the jailer, and I've written about that. We could talk more about that. But then the bit that I think is absolutely fascinating and shows the early church beginning that work um, which they'd already begun in Jerusalem, but now developing it out in the pagan world, of navigating how to cope with the political authorities. The magistrates have ordered Paul and Silas to be beaten and to be thrown into jail. Wait a minute, they're Roman citizens. Any of you read Robert Harris's book, Imperium? It's a life of Cicero, or part of a life of Cicero. He's a great novelist, Harris. Um, British, current British writer. Maybe you know the ancient history. Cicero's speech against Verres. Verres was the governor of Sicily 
and Verres had fleeced Sicily dry. He'd stolen as many artworks as he could find. He'd ruined many of the major citizens. And anyone who grumbled, he had them tortured or flogged or thrown off the dock or even crucified. And on one occasion, which was one of the things that came to Cicero's ears as a young prosecutor in the Roman courts, a Roman citizen had been crucified on Verres' orders. And as he was being tortured and then crucified. He was gasping out, civis romanus sum, civis romanus sum. I'm a Roman citizen, I'm a Roman citizen. And when in Cicero's speech against Verres, he got to the point of saying, this is what happened. He was a Roman citizen. Verres knew it was time to leave town. Verres did not wait for the end of the court hearing. He had to get out and get out fast. And the news of that and we're talking, what, mid-50s BC, so it's about 100 years before, but it goes round the world, that stuff, and the magistrates know that you don't lay hands lightly on a Roman citizen. That is not a good thing to do. You could be in very, very serious trouble. So I love this scene. Here's Paul. He's been beaten. He's been singing hymns at midnight. There's been an earthquake. The jailer is about to commit suicide and then gets converted. Then they have a midnight feast and they baptize the guy and his whole household. And then the next morning, word comes, tell those men to leave. And Paul says, hmm, Roman citizens, beaten without trial, imprisoned, public apology. And he gets it. They're scared. Think about Romans 13. Romans 13 is not saying that everything the authorities do is good. Romans 13 is saying that God wants there to be human authorities because they are serving God's purpose of justice. But if they are serving God's purpose of justice, the strong implication, and it's there all the way through Acts, is that it is part of the task of the church to remind the authorities of what God's purpose of justice looks like. This is not the last time we'll meet this in the book of Acts.